Welcome back to the ZBrush Podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning into ZBrushLive.com and the ZBrush Podcast wherever you're listening. We want to take just a quick moment to talk about ZBrush subscription pricing. And if you follow the link that we have provided in the description, you'll see that we do have a one month price for ZBrush, which is $39.95 a month, or the six month pricing, which is $179.95 a month, or the perpetual license, which is $8.95. And that currently is a one time cost that never expires. So we assume most of you that listen to the podcast already own ZBrush, but if you have friends or people that are interested, in getting into digital sculpting or ZBrush. All of this information can be found by following this link. And for all of you ZBrush podcast listeners, we would greatly appreciate any reviews, comments, or feedback wherever you're watching these episodes or checking out our shows. Also, of course, likes and subscriptions would be greatly appreciated, and we already appreciate all of you that have already done so. If you have been tuning into our content on ZBrushLive.com, we have a very special, unique tool for you using Discord. So in the description of this episode, you'll see a sign-up link, which you can sign up, and you can join the conversation with all the ZBrushers out there that are using Discord. And it's a great way to just communicate and connect with other artists and creative people like yourselves. So we thank all of you ZBrushers out there for your continued support. So that's all the news and information we have for you. We have another exciting episode for you with our guest, Paul Bennett, who is a 3D product designer at Hasbro Toys. Paul's an insanely talented artist, and he's a very knowledgeable artist, not only in the character arts, but also in the articulation and the process that goes into creating toys, which is a very unique skill set. He gave an amazing presentation at the ZBrush Summit in 2019, which we had a chance to sit with him at the summit. That presentation, of course, we will have a link in the description. It's one you absolutely want to watch because this kind of information is very unique and you don't get much of this documented online. So we were so happy and fortunate to have Paul from Hasbro and even being able to sit with him in this episode to get a sort of breath on what goes into making these toys, not only creatively, but the technical understanding that he has. And he is not only an insanely talented sculptor and artist, but he's also a very smart an intelligent artist that can deal with articulation. So this is a very unique episode. You don't want to miss it. So without any further delay, we give you Paul Bennett from Hasbro Toys. You're one of very few people who actually understand articulation yeah. and the really, really technical stuff that seemingly on the surface, I think, could be, um, you know, kind of daunting to people. Yeah. But uh, what is your experience like, I guess, working in toys? Um, what's the, what do you think is the most challenging thing to design and work on a toy? The camouflaging of the joints, for sure, is a, is is kind of the, the problem solving part of it that's really, it's challenging and it's fun. So it's what keeps it fresh every day is, yeah. is okay, well, I, I gotta make this knee joint, but there's this weird piece of armor that's over the knee. Like what, how do, how do I do that? You know, it still has to have the joint, but we, when it bends, it needs to look good too. So yeah. it's a lot of trial and error and testing things out. And when you finally get it, it's like, yes. Yes, <laughs> it's like yeah. a success. Like I was just talking to James back here about this. He is saying that he, he's looking at just our stuff and ZBrush users and it's kind of like, it's a, unique mixture of uh, creative people, artists, but then also engineers in a way where you, you have that engineer sort of brain and that logical kind of brain where you have to f solve these problems. And yeah. sometimes it is trial and error until you get it right. You know, it's like yeah. you create a system and you try and, you know, it's like all you can do is really try. Yeah. And yeah, I'm sure that eventually you'll get to some sort of like solidified sort of method Hopefully. that works. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Even when it's kind of, you know, when I think it's like, oh, well, that's not so great. And then somebody who hasn't been in the project at all looks at it. They're like, what's the problem? I don't see the pro And that's like with any creative problem solving thing. You get too into it, into the weeds with it. Sure. And uh, you can't yeah. really see where you're at. And then yeah. somebody comes along and be like, you know, you're fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. And even in Hasbro, I'm, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you have a specific sort of system or a rather... Um, like type of joint that you use for a lot of things. There's like, you know, for certain characters, it's just use the same things, but are there constant, are you constantly presented with new challenges that you have to solve in those yeah. areas? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the Mandalorian character is gonna have a lot more challenges to him because again, he's got armor in weird places that say a stormtrooper might not have the exact same set of armor. And even the color palette of a certain design will and will help us decide, okay, well, where, where should the brakes be? Because like on a Stormtrooper, he's got that undersuit that's all black. You can hide a lot on yeah. a black figure. But if it's somebody like Ray from F9, she's all bright, you know, right. values and everything. You can't hide right. anything there. And you really have to kind of work really hard to make it look good. Or, or like a Padme even from episode two, where it's oh, yeah. just that white outfit. And it's right. like everything's visible. Mm -hmm. You've you got to really make sure that looks good. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's got to be very challenging. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been working for Hasbro now? I've been connected with them since about March of 2011. Um, I had uh, seen through Ringling, my alma mater, that they were looking for digital sculptors, and at the time I was a traditional sculptor. And I had obviously seen ZBrush's website in the top row and just been like, oh, I have to oh, get into this. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was it, really what drew a lot of people was the top row. When yeah. you start to see just these insane images, you're like, mm -hmm. okay, if I can do that, it's worth it for yeah. a lot of like traditional sculptors that were like kind of on the fence. Yeah, because I, I, I had a fair amount of control over like Castelline and Super Sculpey, but I still knew that I could push it more if like I, I had a tool that was a little bit more of helpful for me and uh, ZBrush being in the digital world there's no gravity you can you know mirror things over to one yeah. side Castelline when I was holding it in my hand I'd melt all the back details oh, that's with my hand quite challenging so I started up putting things on posts and then sculpting it on the post and you know you learn tricks like that right um, but yeah when ZBrush came along that was amazing I wanted to get into it I applied for it and um they, you know, liked that I was a traditional sculptor. They liked that I was from Ringling, and they liked the Thundercat statues that I worked on for Hard Hero. And mm -hmm. um, that kind of all led to me getting a three-month intern, well, temp position with them. Yeah. And uh, it was really a boot camp of digital sculpture for me. So I, I, I didn't know anything about. <laughs> I mean, I had made a head, but I couldn't even mirror the eyeball from one side. Ah, to the right. Other. <laughs> Which is really just figuring out where the button is. Right. Right. right I mean, right. that's not really like a lack of like skill, right? Mm -hmm. It's more as like I think that's the challenge for everybody that if you're on the fence about digital or if you're just learning a new tool, yeah. it's just figuring out where all the stuff is. Yeah. You know, and some people can read the books like uh, Scott Spencer's book at the time. I just read that as much as I could but it was like not so good with the book learning so mm -hmm. having somebody actually in the room being like okay what are you trying to do okay yeah. well here's where this is mm -hmm. that was super helpful for that's me that's great and those were people at Hasbro yeah okay yeah that was absolutely people at Hasbro uh, and I kind of learned a bit of Maya at the same time mm -hmm. so kind of seeing it happen in two different programs helped me understand both a little bit better like subdivision levels were just what are you even talking about? Why do, what is yeah. this? Why do I need this? What yeah. is it? Yeah. I just want to sculpt the ball of clay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, grew into it pretty well within about six months. I felt confident enough to, like, you know, actually start doing work and, and meeting those deadlines. And after three months was over, I went back to Nashville mm -hmm. and freelance for Hasbro for about five and a half years. Uh, wow. So middle of 2016 is when I actually decided to come in house. They offered me a position. Uh, I was on the Star Wars team, so. That's amazing. And it was with um, Tom Rigo, who I'd been working with almost exclusively for about two years. He just kept grabbing me sure. and keeping me away from all the other managers. I see. And just giving me these Like, I'm keeping sweet, this guy. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> yeah. And it was great to work with him. Like, uh, you know, back and forth with him was very natural, very fluid, and uh, it got to a point where I think I could anticipate what he was looking for. Yeah. You know, and he didn't have to spend a lot of time giving me instructions, so it was just bam, 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 right after one that's after a very, another. That's a well-oiled team. Yeah. When you can do that, and you don't have to communicate too much, like you just get. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the ideal. You would, you yeah. know, if we had 20 people all working at that same kind of hive mind, that would right. be, oh, that'd be so amazing. It takes time to develop that kind of relationship. Absolutely does. Right? You said five years of like working with this guy. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely does, so. That was pretty cool, and I, I get to work with them in-house now, too, so we're with the two tag-teaming Star Wars. And That's amazing, and work. there's probably more than enough for you guys to be working on for oh quite a while. <laughs> yes, oh my God. <laughs> and now yes. Mandalorian's out, and yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've just finished all of those, at least the first line of yeah, them. I cannot say how excited I am for that. <laughs> That's so great oh, to hear. I can't wait. It looks amazing. It does. It, it does. really does. It does. I, 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 to be honest, I haven't been this excited about a Star Wars thing in a while. Yeah. I mean, Force Awakens was a big like, yeah. revival. But uh, this looks really good. It does. It does. I think, I working in Hasbro, you know, they have events when every every time a movie comes out. So I do get pretty excited every single time. But this one is like different. It feels different. It feels different. Yeah. It's it's a new thing. It's yeah. a new. It's almost like a new storyline that, even Solo was like, I was excited for that too because it's kind of giving you a different sort of Absolutely. perspective. Initially, I was like. Mm, I, I kind of wanted my Obi Wan movie before I wanted my Han Solo. I was like, movie, I was thinking about that too. I yeah. know, agreed. But agreed. I, I think it, I had fun with it. I really enjoyed that. Movie. I did too. Yeah. I did too. And I know they were talking about Yoda uh, having its own sort of backstory as well. But I don't know what the the story is on that yet. If that yeah. actually got canned, that would or be they, pretty amazing. It I remember would be. seeing a concept art thing of like young Yoda with like so I did <laughs> ripped core. Uh -huh. <laughs> I did a like it was maybe two or three years ago. I was teaching a, a ZBrush course, and it was just intro students, yeah. and I would go through character work with them, and that was one that I did when that right when that was sort of like the buzz was being talked about. Yeah, I want to say it was two years ago, and um, 
yeah, it was like the young Yoda. Like I went through, he's got a sweet pose. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's, it was so much fun and that got me super geeked and then I just never heard anything about it. Hmm. But yeah. it'll happen. I, I think it's so. eventually going to happen. I think people are putting that wish out there and maybe eventually some something cool will happen. For sure. Star Wars isn't going away right. anytime soon. I mean, yeah. it's like, it's funny to think that I, have you ever watched the, there's a documentary, it's, it's, it's on Amazon now. It's actually the documentary about the making of Star Wars episode four or five and six. It's really that. highly focused. One? It's pretty old. It's, okay. I want to say it was like in the 90s. I think I do remember seeing that. Yeah. yeah. And being like, how did I miss this? Like, same. Yeah. That, and I just came across it on Amazon like this last year. Mm-hmm. But you really get an insight into ILM and like the start of ILM and yeah. just the, the very, very simplistic sort of visual effects that they're yeah. doing to create all this stuff. And then they go into the, the, the toy line stuff yeah. and where that comes into play and just, yeah. you know, the big sort of machine that that turns into. Yeah. And now you have this big corporate entity yeah. that's just like a monster that'll yeah. never go away yeah you know and i think that was the one also that where george was telling about the struggle it was to try and just get financing for yeah four, and then how each movie had its own challenge it was really interesting i was like again how did i miss this, this i crazy. had the same feeling but i'm glad that it's great to discover things like that Absolutely. later you know yeah, you almost appreciate it more exactly yeah, yeah exactly. if i would have seen it when it came out i wouldn't have even had it w- you know i was just a star wars nerd yeah. I wasn't actually making and working in visual effects or working right. as an artist. So it means so much more now. It does. Yeah. It does. Mm-hmm. So the uh, kinds of IP, what, what do you find to be, um, I mean, you're working on a lot of Star Wars stuff. Mm-hmm. What do you find to be uh, what you prefer? What is your sort of uh, favorite thing that you love about creating toys? Oh, boy. My favorite thing that I prefer working on toys is, I think, being that person that, that keeps it to a certain standard and, like, making sure that you're protecting the brand and that you're doing it justice mm. and that you're doing the best you can or you're helping the, the freelancer do the best they can and giving them all the help in the world to try and make sure that that version of Luke or that version of Ray is the absolute pinnacle of an archival quality figure. You know? Yeah. That being that guardian of it, I think is that I, I feel a very strong sense of duty about that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that just because you know that that's something that's going to be, special to a kid or somebody who's purchasing yeah. that thing that's yeah. sort of like an it, iconic figure I'm sure <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit of uh, ego as well just making sure you're doing a good job yeah and like you want to go home at the end of the day and know that you kind of left it all on the stage you know that you did your best and that's tied up into it as well yeah um, yeah. yeah yeah no I can imagine I mean, there is a I mean, we grew up in a time where toys were a lot more, I feel like, I don't know. I don't know what the toy culture is like now for kids growing up. Like, I was big into action figures. Like, that was a thing. But I played yeah. with my toys. Right. You know what I mean? It's I was like, outside in the sandbox and playing with my exactly. Superman and everything. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And now I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I know that collection is a big thing. It is. But it's still, no matter what, these, I mean, clearly there's a, there's a want for these things. Yeah. Because you guys are so busy. Yeah. And there's so think, many of them. You know, it's probably like anything else where... Where, uh, certain kids just are a little bit more active in their imagination and they don't mm-hmm. necessarily need everything spoon fed to them. You hand them an action figure and they start writing that story themselves. Right. But then it's tough to compete with a lot of, you know, the video cell games yeah. and phones yeah. and VR now yeah. and whatever else is coming. Right. So yeah. trying to get them something that is entertaining in that way as well, but also still provides them with that format of an action figure. Sure. Um, so yeah. It branches out into role play items. It branches out into you know all kinds of stuff. That's, yeah, that could be fun. It helps the whole ecosystem. I think. Right. Yeah. No, that's a good point. So tell me a little bit about the process. If you're going through and you're you, you're you know, sort of tasked to create a specific Star Wars figure, sure. how do you guys go about conceptual sort of design to sort of full sure. um, you know final product? Well, um, I could just take like a movie figure for example. Mm-hmm. Um, with any luck, we'll have some set photos of the actor, you know, actually like in a turnaround position. Sometimes that stuff can come kind of late stage. Yeah. But if it's an established character like Luke or Ray, and if it's for a new movie, we more, more or less know what the actor looks like or how big they are and everything. And we can use the concept art to start basing out some stuff in a sculpt. But more than likely, we want to try and push it until we get that final photographic reference. Um, and when that comes in, we're moving, we're really moving. And um, it's usually a kickoff with the toy designers themselves and talking to them about, okay, well, what do you guys want in this particular figure? You know, and then adding your own spin into it too. It's like, well, what if the holster was like separate and we could then move the leg differently and get more flexibility out of it? And we kind of hash out the basics of what that figure should be. And then uh, the sculpting manager will then kind of make a kickoff for a freelancer and kind of say, 
here's what we talk about with a design and maybe there's a sketch, maybe there's not. Sometimes it's just, it's too fast. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't, you don't have time to do like a outline of all the joints. And that's where having a freelancer who knows what the black series joints need to be and where they are and right. how they should move doesn't need all that. They yeah. just get, they get the photographic reference of the actor in the costume and two weeks you've got a sculpt. Wow. And it's like two weeks. If they're pushing it really hard. Wow. Yeah. It's quite yeah. a turnaround. And if it's, especially for, if it's a situation where we got that photographic uh, reference late, we have to push and it, it sucks. And I, I hate being the guy to, to tell a freelancer to, have to hurry. push. Right. Yeah. I, I want them to have that standard four weeks because we'll get a much better figure. It's just better for the figure and right. for everybody overall. Right. Yeah. And so if they get a little more time too, then on the back end, there aren't as many comments from the licensor. If we rush it, then there are a lot of comments from Lucasfilm and right. we still have to take that extra two weeks to fix it. So right. You're going to pay for it eventually, uh, but sometimes we have to push, you know, just to make sure the dates are where they should right. be and everything. Um, right. It's a big machine. It you is. You guys have a lot of stuff going on in many different places, right? It is, yeah. And um, especially if it's a movie, you're talking maybe 12 figures all at once that we have to get seated out with uh, yeah. freelancers and get them rolling on it. And so um, that can be pretty stressful. And one freelancer we'd like to just check in with maybe twice a week and just even if even if it's a rough progress just show us what you're working on and how you're doing it because i might see something in there that might be like okay well you, know, you see the sash the way you've got that laying on the one side we were actually thinking about pulling that slightly over sorry we didn't mention it but you know and that helps us from having to make anybody have to go back a couple of steps because we'd rather just you get one two three you check you can you know four five six check and you just keep moving forward you don't waste any time yeah uh, and just checking in like that and that's pretty standard you know working with a freelancer sure and then hopefully they're able to hit the deadline and hopefully all the joints are where they should be and they work well and the wall thicknesses are correct and the portrait looks great. And then it gets submitted to the licensor. Uh, and at that point, they get pretty much a, a render of the sculpt and then our, our concepts, if there's something special about it that we really want them to pay attention to and say, yeah. hey, we really want this you know, forearm monkey to have a triple torso, you know, is that yeah. cool? Is that all right? And you're yeah. like, heck yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> like, all right, maybe they'll like it. More maybe. joints? Why not? <laughs> sure. Let's do six. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as long as it, you know, it, as far as like the Black Series line is concerned, that, that needs to look as much like it does in the film. So as long as it doesn't interfere with the aesthetics too much, you know, we can get away with quite a bit. Yeah, and, that's interesting. Uh, then it gets approved and... From that point, uh, we send it down to our RP lab, and they print it out. And sometimes it's at that point that you know we'll find things that we didn't notice before. We try to assemble it back together, like I was saying, the presentation offset. So if, yeah. if, if the offset isn't right, we can't put it together. We gotta you know either sand it down by hand if we're short on time, or request more prints. And oh wow, it's a whole process. And the print time is you know you might be waiting for how many days for a prototype like that. They're, ideally, we try to give them about a week because there's not just dealing with Star Wars toys. It's you know Marvel, it's Baby Alive for real, and it's all kinds of sizes and shapes. And yeah. my stuff is on a build plate on the form cell with somebody else's stuff, and they've got to keep track of all those parts. And so there's a lot of paperwork involved with that. Yeah. And that, but hopefully within a week we get a tray full of parts, and yeah. they're all cleaned up and beautiful. And, and if not, yeah, <laughs> if not, we just we just have to you know communicate like anything else, just communicate and see what what happened, how we can help. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's our fault. There was like floating geometry, and they have to spend a lot of time like repairing the OBJs or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully, you know, the print comes back. It looks good. We we put it together. And then it gets shipped off for production. So at that point, um, you know, we start involving the teams overseas who are actually, you know, looking at how we're going to tool this and how is yeah. this going to, how is this going to be produced? And um, some challenges can come up at that point um, that we have to kind of, okay, we'll send us your OBJs back. Let's take a look at it and see what the problem is. And um, a lot of times they want to just make it really great for production, but then it's that really affects the aesthetics sometimes. So then it's how do we find that balance? So yeah. It's functional, but it still looks good. And it's not, you know, the licensor is still going to be happy with it at the next stage. Right. Uh, and that, that can be challenging. Uh, I can imagine, because yeah. the, the, the functionality of it all, I guess, depending on the, how complex it is, that can detract from certain elements in the figure or things yeah. need to get moved around, maybe. Yeah. Um, so, for example, like Chewbacca's head, you know, if you want that fur to lay over his chest the way it, it does in the film, you just have to accept that he's never going to be able to turn his head. But that doesn't stop us from putting a ball joint in there. It's just, <laughs> it's just never going to move. Right. That's something I think that everybody across the board understands that, you know, 
I don't, I don't want to see a Chewbacca where his hair only comes to here and he gets great ratings. Right. It's just you're missing a key element right. to the figure. It'd right? be so weird looking. It would be really <laughs> weird. Even a young Chewbacca, clearly, we've already established that yeah. in Solo. Like he's yeah. just, he basically looks the same. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So until there's, you know, I, I guess a more flexible PVC that would actually allow for a greater range of motion, everybody I think understands that that joint is never really going to see any great range of motion. Yeah. But, uh, I, I think that can, that can trickle down to other figures as well where, uh, you just have to accept, look, this is the way it's designed. I didn't design the character, and this is really the best I think we can do based on our limitations with production and manufacturability. But um, I think the, the people at Lucasfilm, they're all very familiar with the toy business, so you know they know about joints. They even yeah. use ZBrush to make toys, so they, right. they get it. And yeah. uh, it doesn't take too much explanation. I think we're really lucky in, in that point in that they do understand that language. You yeah. Know, we don't have to start from ground zero. I'm sure that makes it just much easier for the conversation for things to get pushed forward. So yeah. you, you're, you can communicate with them where there's not a disconnect in the production pipeline yeah. where they just don't get it. Right. And you have to sort of explain it to them. If they understand that, it's probably better for you. Yeah. And then before my time, apparently, you know, in different licensors, that has happened before where, you know, somebody just doesn't understand the process and they ask for things that it's just... Almost like, you cannot I, do. I can't. I'm sorry. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not, not trying to play hardball. It's just like, right. literally, I can't pull the moon down and give it to you. So. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. That happens all the time, though. Like, yeah. it, it's always like, even if you're presented with a new problem, it's part of our job, too. Is like, you look at going back to that documentary uh, about Star Wars 4, 5, and 6, and they're presented with problems they literally don't have solutions well, yeah. for. They were coming up with them on the fly. Exactly, yeah. And I guess I just wonder in, for you guys, do you find, because I know that there's, you know, you've seen sort of, I look at the action figures from even before my generation where there's literally just one point of articulation, right? You're just doing yeah. this. It's just a figure locked in space. And, and maybe you get like an arm that moves. And then you get into like the extra joints where you can start flexing and moving the mm -hmm. ball joints. And then now you'll have like two torso points where you can move this. So you can kind of get that like, you know, yeah. that sort of rib cage movement and then waist. Is Do you see that there's an evolution in at least in figures for trying to come up with new ways? Constantly. Yeah. You're always doing that? Every time we look Anytime, even if it's a, another, just another Luke Skywalker figure, we're, we're looking at, does this design allow us to try something new? And if so, is it a benefit or is it, we're not really getting much out of it? And we try to really squeeze in wherever we can. Yeah. And uh, I, the sculpting department has a lot of freedom in that way and, and that you know, if, we can, if we can try something out and we test it and then we show it back to design or even to the licensor and we're like, eh? And they're like, <laughs> okay, <do> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it you goes. You guys are way out in left right, field on that one. Right, right. <laughs> and that is what keeps it fresh, that is being able to problem solve like that. And uh, if, if that went away and we were just kind of cookie cuttering the same you know, toys for the next 20 years, um, the competition would just leave us in the dust. You know? sure. and I, I think we all have to inspire each other to try to kind of keep moving, keep moving up and, yeah. and try to outdo one another all the time. Yeah. It, just, it just makes better toys for the consumer when you have that competition. So Definitely. Yeah. I think challenging any aspect is, is good for everybody. Yeah. You know? I mean, well... For the most part, yes. Right, right. There's a limit to that. <laughs> There's probably <laughs> some things that we can get into that maybe that's not, not good. Yeah. But for the yeah. most part, when it comes to this kind of stuff, great. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I was talking to Shane Olson about it. he was just going through the the, the sort of revisions and the, the dealing with, say, some a big IP like Disney or, you yeah. know, in this case, like Marvel, this kind of stuff where you have very iconic characters that people love so much. Yeah. Um, for you guys, what is your process as far as like doing likenesses and things like this? Are you guys sculpting sure. all these things by hand? Mostly, yeah. Okay. Mostly it is by hand. Um, and Shane Olsen stuff is amazing, by the way. We yeah. all, I think all of us at Hasbro have at least one Disney Infinity figure that we're like, I miss it. Mine. <laughs> it's so great. I, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I only really discovered it at the tail end of it. Oh, yeah. But man, the figures, once those, him and Matt, when they started posting their stuff and I actually started seeing some of the ZBrush work and some of their key shot renders, I just felt like it was such a unique and like very specific style that like I really had never seen before, yeah. and it was so fresh. Yeah, you know, it was understated in a way that was, it was so subtle, but it was mm. so good at the same yeah. time. And the scale was perfect. Yeah, the style popped at that scale. You got it from five feet away, but it yeah. also still had a lot to show you when you got it up close. It was right. brilliant, and the way they separated out the parts for production to save money on deco, but it still looked really good. So yeah. like Boba Fett's backpack in that is like four or five different pieces. And yeah. It's just like, good job, that's guys. Nice. <laughs> that's like, on the inside, yeah. that's such a nerd it is. thing where you're like, oh, we, that's Yeah, we so sit there awesome. and we would study it, just be like, oh, 
that's such a great idea. idea. Touche. Very nice. <laughs> Touche, yeah. sir. <laughs> yeah. So we really appreciated that line and all the work those guys did. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. What was your question? Uh, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just more curious about just as far as, because I'm kind of getting into, there's a lot of people that in, going into toys and in, in prototyping in general, yeah. it's it's a very applicable skill for, especially ZBrushers out there, for people that are using digital sculpture. Yeah. And there's a lot of work to be done. Yes. Um, so it's I know that there's a lot of people that have questions about these things and want to get into this industry. And for you, you're a traditional. You come from yeah. a traditional sculpting background. So I imagine your experience with sculpture gave you the ability to actually start to figure out the anatomy and the form and being able to probably sculpt likenesses. Well, what does it take for you guys to get to capture the actual essence of that character? Well, it you can never have enough reference. So even even we'll get you know the dozen or so turnarounds from Lucasfilm that are extremely high res. When you like zoom in on the actor's face, you see everything. It's, yeah. And they're beautiful photographs. Um, so we, we obviously use that, but at the same time, if it's, if it's somebody who's now very much in the public eye, there's Google Images and just set it to a large image and just right. start downloading as many faces as you can. Yep. Um, and I usually will go for neutral faces, you know, it's just very blank face because it, if I start there, I can then express it into anything I right. want, but all the work goes into that neutral face mm -hmm. first. And I make just one long lineup row myself. You know, you can just do it however you want. But, and I size all the images to the exact same size. So I draw a ruler through the eye line and a ruler through the mouth. And on the very left side, I've got pictures of the actor looking fully you know, to the left. And as you come to the center of the row, they're facing me. And as you go all the way to the right, they're looking to the right. So it's almost like as I'm scrolling, they're turning. Right, you're getting that full yep. sort of profile all the way around. So Almost like what I would imagine a computer would try to do to like you know that deep fake stuff where you right. you know you're trying to get uh -huh. the sense of, and if there's photos of the actor where they're slightly looking down, I can see the the form of their face because a lot of times when you start doing portraits, very flat, right? And like especially this area, it's like how do you, what is happening there? It's, it's so like, hard to see the curves, yeah, of the, like the bony structures and getting that top view is actually really important, right? Yeah. Especially with the shape of the skull yeah. and how the face works, yeah. yeah. And the same with an upward view, seeing all of that stuff. And um, so having that reference row is super critical. That's always up on my second screen. But then I generate my image planes from that as well. So I, I try to pick the best front view that works really well for me. I'll make an image plane of that. Since mm -hmm. they're all the same size too, I right. only have so to Right, so they're pre-measured and they'll line up perfectly. Right, so all I have to do is size that first one when I bring it in. And then when I start bringing in the other photos from different angles, I don't have to change the scale, it's already set. Yep. And, uh, and then I basically make, it looks kind of crazy, but there's a, there's a sculpt head in the middle, and then there's just this array of reference images and image planes all around it. And cool. I've saved views for every angle. I see. And so, you know, there's only eight views in ZBrush's Zap link, but yeah. I just views one, views two, and I'll have like four or five view yeah. sets that'll be like most of my front views. So you're saying you want more views? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that'd be okay. great. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass that be, along. Be, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> don't, don't get too out of hand, but yeah, I would. I would love how more about, views. How about 30 views? Be, mm, <laughs> sure. Yeah, that'd why, be great. Why not? Mm, fantastic. <laughs> that'd be awesome if you could label the views yeah, too. Well, okay, oh. all right. <laughs> now he's wanting his glass of milk too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's uh, there's a bit of a trick. It, well, it's not really that much of a trick because uh, I sculpt with perspective off. So then the image planes I'm looking at, you know, they're shot with cameras with lenses at different distances and focal lengths. And so I, I I'm not going to spend the time to sit there and match the focal. It's length so of difficult each one. to match that. Right. It really is, and you're never going to get it perfectly dead on, right? right? So it can distort your sculpture. Right. Yeah. So really, I in each photo, I look for the areas that are probably the least distorted, and that's where I allow the photo to instruct me as to how it should look. So if it's an image kind of from here, then only really this part of the face I'm going to trust. The profile and everything where that perspective is going to warp a little bit more, mm -hmm. I, I can't trust that photo. And that's why I need so many of them, because I'm kind of patching that reference of that yeah, actor. That's a, really, that's a really good point. That's a good tip. It helps. It yeah. helps. And when the gizmo came along, because when you, you tap on the surface of a mesh and the gizmo stays in that one place, unlike the transpose bar, when you tap on the, the surface, it stays yeah. there. But as soon as you move an image plane or something, that pro trans transpose bar stays where it was, but right. the gizmo moves with it. Yeah. I use the gizmo as kind of a alignment tool. So whenever I, I'm trying to line that weird angle up of that image plane, I'm using the arrow that's faced at right, me. And then you can switch over. Right. And then yeah. I'm making sure there's no distortion on the image plane where it's kind of off, you know, up or right. down. And so I get a little bit more accurate that way. Uh, and that, that has been, that's, that's been a, a help. It's a pro move. It gets I me, like it. it gets me to about 60, 65%. Yeah. There is still that jumping off point where you're just, you're lost. You're just looking at the reference 
and you know you've used the image planes as much as you can yeah and you you do have to have that practice or experience of of figuring it out to yeah. get to that 85 90 percent likeness i know a lot of us have like i've gone through that so many times doing a likeness and i'm sure a lot of people have done this too where there is that it's like that time where it's just meh it's like there's just uh and then you're like okay now yeah. i'm getting there and then you start to hit a point where you like you feel like you finally got to a place where you got some part right. of it. A hook like, is in. Yeah, exactly. you're being dragged, but yeah. you don't know yeah. how do I do. Th- okay, this is good. <laughs> yeah, we're moving. Just gotta keep pushing stuff yeah. around until it gets there. Yeah. Like. And before that, when I first started doing portraits, when I was in that prior to the hook being set kind yeah. of point, you know, from zero to sixty percent, I would call it. That's a scary place to be. You start like questioning all your life goals and <laughs> just being like, I'm terrible. <laughs> People come in and you're just like, go away. Don't look at it. <laughs> Don't judge me on this. Yeah. And the more experienced people will just be like, no, dude, it's cool. I get it. You've been on this three hours. That's mm-hmm. it. You know, it should be done by now, but yeah. <laughs> that's fine. And you need your time. You need your time to, to have it be a mess. And yeah. that's okay. Like, and I don't, I don't judge anybody who's first starting out doing portraits for, especially if they're like one of our in-house temps or anything. It's like, no, this is okay. This is where you're supposed to be, is lost in the weeds and the fog, right. you know, and it's, you'll find your way. Here's some things I would suggest to kind of set you back on the path. Yeah. And it's awesome to be there whenever somebody comes back and they're like, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. And I go over there and they did. They and you it. hope that the person's going to go, you got it. Yeah. Right? But even then, sometimes you don't. And we're like, yeah. I've done that so many times. We're like, I think I got it. And I'm like, eh, well, you know, you're still missing this. And right. we're like, oh, right. I thought I had it this time. But my judgment is usually about like, if they get to like 60 or 70%, I can tell who it is. It may not be the best portrait, but I know who it is. Okay. And that's like, okay, well, that's good enough, but let's take it another 20 or 30%, and mm-hmm. here's how I would do that, and try to help them you know, with little tricks here and there to, yeah. to get them to push it further, because the more we can squeeze out of the likeness, the better the toy is going to look, and yeah. the licensor is going to have like, no issue with it. They're I can imagine, right. because it, when, when I, I've seen, I mean, I've seen, it's been thinking about toys that just had less fidelity, you know, yeah. uh, older generations where they just, you couldn't quite capture it, yeah. uh, the, a sort of a likeness where it just doesn't look like the person, yeah. you know? It's like, it's got everything, but it's not it. And there is, a, it does detract from it in some way, especially if it's yeah. like something you really, really love, yeah. or if it's from mm-hmm. an actor or a person that you really love. Mm. So I see the value in that, and yeah. that being very challenging. I find it interesting that you guys don't tend to use, um, like, there's no scan data, really, or if you're coming from, I guess if you're on, like, say, on Avengers, you might get some actors that do get scanned, yeah. like, like like a Mark Ruffalo kind yeah. of situation or something like that. More often than not, they, they do get scanned, but the the frequency of them actually getting to us, the scans themselves, it's, it's usually too little or too late. So I see. a lot of times we, we just have to go without it. Yeah. Uh, if we do get it, even if it's late, it's great to check the overall proportions of things. Right. But... Even if we had it at the beginning, a lot of it would probably need to be, you know, re-sculpted and re-subtooled anyway, because we would need to have those subtools to right. make edits to. So it ends up being just from the time that it takes for those things to transfer, you're better off to just do it, and you'll be done the way before you're ever going to get it. Probably, yeah. yeah. I mean, in an ideal world, it'd be great to have a scan for every single figure sure. you start with, but yeah. But then there's also the. It's such a it's such an art form to do likenesses, and I yeah. never want that to go away. I really think that that I appreciate that you guys are able to do that yeah. sculpturally speaking. We uh, joke constantly in our department about people who don't use the brush that you know kind of question the timelines and everything. It's yeah. like they just they just all think we have a you know sculpt yeah, here the, here's the make actor button you know exactly it's that. like it's exactly that <laughs> oh, yeah you know it's, we would just be kidding it's a we don't do it just does it for you yeah, just <laughs> auto right yeah they just make that stuff up oh it's so hard yeah <laughs> my gosh do they have no idea and i mean maybe with this deep fake stuff like maybe you know in the future it will be it that might. but it will probably still need some cleanup sure and you, you need people who know how to do that yeah and uh, i think it's, when photography came along painting didn't completely go away. You know? yeah. It certainly lessened it, for sure. Not everybody was getting their family portrait done in oil anymore. Right. But, um, there's still an, a niche for it. Yeah. yeah. I think the art forms, they always they always exist. It's mm-hmm. just, at this time, there's sort of like a, there's a golden age of like utility where there's so many artists now in positions where, you know, you could be just focusing on articulation. You could be yeah. focusing on likenesses. You could be just a, a production artist that just makes game characters. Yeah. and Or you yeah. could be a like a crazy creature concept artist. Yeah. And those are positions that you can fill. Mm-hmm. And they'll always exist. But, you know, there's a whole house of people that just build environments right now mm-hmm. that 
eventually those might go away, you know, with scan data and like, you know, high mega scan files that like you can just capture reality yep. and just you're manipulating exist, existing stuff, not creating it from scratch. Yeah. You know, but like, I love that those things do exist, mm -hmm. the creating from scratch element, mm -hmm. just as ZBrush artists. I mean, we know it's like you, there's something so awesome about being able to just make something from your brain, you Absolutely, know? Absolutely, yeah. You know? I think when that starts to happen, because it probably will eventually, um, I would, I would think we're all gonna have to ask ourselves like, why are we creating? Not to get too deep or anything. No, no, like, I love why it. Why are we, why are we putting so much time and effort into this? What is the psychology of this? And if there is a lot of support to create some of the more mundane things that look really great, like in environments and things, but a lot of times when you're playing a video game, you just kind of take it for granted that you ran past a tree. Yeah. Somebody put a lot of work into that tree. Totally. You know? like, that's yeah. an amazing tree. Can uh -huh. we stop to look at the Can tree? But it's, <laughs> but it's like a Call of Duty game, and so you're just like running for your life, and you just right. don't see it. Right. Um, but that I would hope that people still who would have a need to, to sculpt some things, they would really then get to focus on that core part of why they're trying to do this. Like, yeah. what am I trying to express here? Mm -hmm. like, what is that? And trying to find that more. Yeah. And I would hope that then society as a whole would, would support them in, yeah. in their expression. You know? I agree. I, I don't know who I was talking to about this yesterday. It was just on the topic of just how we're extracting so much of this photorealistic world using scan data and capturing things and putting it into games and just m making our lives we're so sort of surrounded by it. even in visual effects the photorealistic cinematic world is getting kind of dull you know we got to the point where we made it so good that people started blaming visual effects for the fault of the movies and it wasn't that at all right. we perfected that if anything else mm -hmm. it's all the other stuff that wasn't yeah. getting taken care of and so now it's like I, I see you to your point it's it actually creates more of a value. We see that and we go, that's just boring. We need to make this more fantastical and actually spend time, like if it's a tree, I don't want just a photorealistic oak tree. I want an oak tree with like a face in it and some mm -hmm. crazy ornate things that are more, you know, interesting. Fantastical. Yeah, yeah, things that I don't see in reality, right? Yeah. And I think that's probably why those things, this stuff will always exist. Um, and maybe even more so down the road. Yeah, it's just sort of like a shifting of the times, where yeah, you're getting things like deep fakes, and the reality is getting distorted to a point now where we can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 So it's, I, I got that face app, and I you know took a photo of myself. And my girlfriend the whole time is like, you know, how Russia's got your ID and everything. Else? I don't care. They can have it. You know, like whatever. We can't protect ourselves yeah, anymore. I right? want to see what I look like at 60 years old. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, because you could you could fake it to where you. And it was pretty. I look like George Carlin apparently. <laughs> it was oh wow, cool. <laughs> that's not bad. Yeah, man. yeah. Carlin's great. Yeah, I'll be ready. For you just the, need uh, the ponytail. Yeah, and the, the Bill and Ted remake. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. Just do the, the aging makeup. I just rewatched Bill and Ted recently. Me too. Yeah, it's, it's classic. Awesome. It is. Well, yeah. I mean, they're remaking. It, or they're bringing the sequel out. They are. So it is built in three because they did in two, so, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I want to see Keanu Reeves and I forget the other guy's name. Keanu Reeves. I, I'm just very curious to see what it's going to be like for him to do like a comedy role I, again. Yeah, I can't help but think it's going to be amazing for him to come back around to that after mm -hmm. so long. I can't wait for that. I, I, I it's going to be super interesting. <laughs> yeah. At the very least. Yeah. At the very least. Um, well then, uh, so for your um, for your presentation, you you talked a lot about these things, right? Mm -hmm. Just the the process for this for you know people who listen to this conversation. That's illustrated in your presentation. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can only imagine. I'm sure it is. And you, um, I'm curious, like on the creative side, compared to I mean, you coming from digital sculptor, mm. transitioning into the the sort of aesthetics of a because I know that keys and joints and all that stuff is so important. Was that uh, a process for you? Like, how did you go about learning those tools? Well, uh, every job I got just from Hasbro anyway kind of got more complex. They were really good about kind of building me up yeah. to something, and I think they do that with most people. It's, it's not the new guy's fault if you throw a, a four-armed monkey on him first job, and he, like, he didn't he didn't, he didn't hit it. Well, yeah. yeah, you crushed him. Like, what did you expect? You threw so, one of the hardest, most complex figures. Right. So, yeah. And it's not we're trying to hold people back. It's we're trying to make sure that people are lifting the right amount of weight every time and they're, they're building up to it. So yeah. I started off working with the statues with Hard Hero and um, I, I, you know, I got really good at keying, and they weren't joints, but like keying in, making sure the arms were separate so we could mold it and everything. Mm. So I already kind of had that experience. And then in digital, especially when Dynamesh came along, which changed everybody's lives, I think. It did. It was amazing. It was Absolutely. awesome. Um, that 
it just became like, okay, well, I need this to fit in here. I knew it needs to be slightly bigger, so I'd ask the manager, what, have you guys been figuring out like what the offset needs to be on this? Like, what should I do? And, and then I got the information, 0.12 millimeters, and that's yeah. usually a good starting point. Yeah. And then you just start building that into your workflow, and it, it, it's kind of, and I say common sense, but it's like common sense solutions, very simple, you know, not too not too theoretical or crazy, mm, but yeah. very simple solutions that you run up to a problem, you fix it, you run up to a problem, you fix it, and by the end of it, you have a very complex solution that you have, but I couldn't have told you every step of that way, and yeah. the, the process reveals that solution as you I go, see. so you, you kind of have to get lost in the weeds, and yeah. you just do it over and over and over and over again, and you, you get more confident about being able to kind of whack that mole as it comes up. Yeah. You know? yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the, you bring up Dynamesh, I can imagine for you as a traditional sculptor, that must have been, I mean, going to, trying to figure out subdivisions and all that kind of stuff yeah. is like... It's oh, like it happened oh. backwards. I almost yes. wish Dynamesh had been around first. And right. Yeah, because I, I use more subdivision levels and dynamic subdivision levels and, and, and topology now to help me sculpt things. And I would have never done that earlier on. If you had had Dynamesh. Yeah. Right. But I think most of the people in the field, you know, they were already used to like box modeling. They knew what... Yeah, a divided surface look like and yeah. you know vertices and lines and faces. I didn't have that at all. It was yeah. just like it doesn't make any sense. Right, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, it, it tends to work out with the way that ZBrush kind of uh, sort of functions. Where, like talking to Shane Olson about this, he has the he has the the approach where you he breaks down form and figure with primitives. Like you yeah. have separate parts, yeah. right? I came up in that traditional sort of sense where you have low subdivisions and you have high subdivisions, but yeah. but the low, when you have less points, you can use move brush and capture yes. those edges and yeah. those curves and not get lumpy surfaces. Yep. And you know, it's like it's just more of an elegant way to work. Yep. It's like you get all the form and figure at one and two, and then you go up to three and you can push it a little bit more. And that was sort of like the learning curve was don't go up too high, don't sculpt yep. too high, and then destroy and be, you know the yeah. the crappy sculpt kind of thing where you get your polishing a turd is yeah. like the scenario, right? Yeah. But with Dynamesh, it's more challenging, but that's more of like a traditional sort of clay sort of workflow. Yeah. And it's I can't do it. It's the chaos. <laughs> it's like I like to use Dynamesh for just fusing stuff together, but then I want to yeah. go zebra mesh it and mm -hmm. then just stay low. I'm probably a little more on that side with you. Yeah. You know? But it just, as it, as it applied to what we were doing at the time, there were these little uh, fighter pods, I think they were called initially, and they were like squeakies, little... Little squishy, oh, yeah, okay. and the, but they were all Star Wars figures, and, and yeah. they were like chunky styled, and they were so much fun to sculpt on. But you'd have a lot of sub tools, and then sometimes you know they're all piled up on each other, and we go to before Dynamesh and Z remesh, use remesh, and then Z project brush all of it back on to make the watertight print file. Yeah. Oh man, that it gave me a really great appreciation for Dynamesh when it finally came along. I bet. Yeah. I can imagine <laughs> just being able to do like the shelling and yeah. subtracting subtractions into the surface like yeah. that stuff was a big deal for a lot of people in your industry. Yes. In-house we had freeform and we had the arm and everything yeah. but Hasbro was like, you know, you're not this this costs way more than you're gonna be able to afford out as a freelancer, so don't get dependent on it. You need to learn to remesh and project things. Yeah. And so that was good advice, but it was about a year later after that when we got Dynamesh. Yeah. But it could have been longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What what about I guess transitioning from Dynamesh to say you now live booleans, do you guys find yourself using that a lot oh, more man. now? That I think I would, if I would set like major chapters in yeah. ZBrush's advancements, yeah. uh, I think live booleans is the biggest thing that happened since Dynamesh. Dynamesh. And yeah. for me especially, because I, I preserve my sub tools into a very late stage in the game. So like in the Mandalorian helmet, for example, like every part of that I had sub tooled when I sent it to the licensor, because at any, at any time they could have said, make this bigger or small, and we had to yeah. react quickly. And yeah. all of my sub tools generally are decimated as well so the, it's a really quick file to open the whole figure with weapons is like right. two million points at most okay uh, with joints and everything that's so, great um, but then live booleans just allows me to utilize that crisp uh, decimated geometry without any boom. smoothing or anything right right, right. and, and you, the processing time yeah yeah and so we're even at high levels of uh, Dynamesh, you'd get that slight web in mm -hmm. between two hard edge right. things, and it's like, and it, it would never show up in production. But for somebody like me, who's really anal you about it. You just want it to right. stay. Right. And I the get fact it. that it happens so quickly with live booleans, where it's just mm -hmm. done, it's like, oh, that's right. great. <laughs> right. I can't believe it. Yeah, it's I know. amazing. I it's, it. it's honestly, I mean, I use it now, I use it as a, a pure just modeling tool really I, I'm using it to do all kinds of things just because especially with hard surface yeah 
I don't know how much you're dealing with hard surface at all. I mean, you use things time. like the, the helmets mm -hmm. and like the accessories, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but I, it depends because, you know, you get, if you need to sculpt on that surface, live mm -hmm. bullions kind of goes away. You'd have to dynamish it again if you wanted yeah. to surface on top. Yeah. But it just to do things like cuts and grooves and all kinds of stuff, it's got so many utilities now. And yeah, it's just amazingly fast. And it's so clean. Oh, it's and so, nice. so clean. Yeah. The, the guys that worked on that really did a amazing job yes they did yeah <laughs> yeah well they'll be happy to hear that you guys are appreciating those features we are we are yeah. absolutely <laughs> that's yeah. great that's fantastic um so then for the for you just for the future of hasbro i mean you got mandalorian uh all that stuff is basically coming out mm -hmm. soon or now the end or of the year. yeah okay yeah, i think it's november or december okay and I, I think it'll be incremental episode releases if i'm not mistaken i'm not a don't know for sure. I mean, I'm I sure that they're is, very yeah. protective of the information yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. But I even bet I'll be signing up for Disney Plus on for just for that. They're going to get me on that yeah. just for that alone. Yeah, exactly. I know that's that's. I, I was saying I, was, I just I I, I don't want to end up having all these streaming services, and I was like maybe I'm just going to pass on Disney Plus, and then they put that, and I was like, <laughs> yep, you got me on <laughs> yep, that one. Absolutely, you just suckered me in. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. So then I assume that there will. be... Are there any other projects or things that you'd uh, like to mention? Or um, episode nine is, is you know coming out as well, so we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um, things after that, I don't, I don't think I can really say anything about anything after That's that. That's understandable. Yeah. Episode nine, how many figures do you guys have? Do you know? Oh boy, uh, I'm pretty sure it's the full complement of the main cast. Yeah. So we got Ray, Kylo, Poe, um, Finn couple of new characters. I don't know if they've released the names yet or not. Okay. Um, Let's just be safe they, in that. They, they, yeah, they, Triple Force Friday previews, they showed a lot of them. Okay. Um, yeah. But I, I'm frankly more familiar with their code names. In uh, house than oh, I you have code have names. Their, yes, we do. Yeah, and each each company that deals with licenses has to have their own set of code names. So it's all part of the, part of the uh, IP sensitivity okay. process. Yeah. So when the movies come out, you know, us on the team, we're just like, oh, that's blah, 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 blah. And we don't, and when they say their name in the movie, it's like, that's not their name. <laughs> like, that's, you know, we're so like brainwashed. You're just so like used right. to hearing it that way. Exactly. <laughs> like I, I had to, you know, and we don't ever go back and rename our archive stuff. It's still all the code names. Oh, wow. So you then, could forget like, what's yeah, when name I name again? Yeah, yeah. When I came in house, like I had to help work on uh, Rogue One stuff and I didn't know their, except for the figures I did as a freelancer, yeah. I didn't know the code names. And yeah. Especially if you then have a figure that's built half from parts from a previous movie that had different code names that now have to get tooled and matched up to the new parts. It's like, okay, well, half this figure is blah, 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 and half this is that. And it's like, oh, boy. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and really, only the people that handled those files know that library. So, yeah. Um, and now that I've been here, you know, a little three and a half years now, it's like, I, I forget that the, the temps and the interns don't. No, they can't read my mind. They, they, they right. don't know where the heck to go. Right, <laughs> right. That's just another part of the, I guess, the, the position that you get used to. Yeah. 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 So I guess in, the, in those sense, too, I wanted to quickly ask the, because um, we talk a lot about figures, but you guys do have, there's other stuff that you do, like ships and uh, like vehicles. That's mm -hmm. another Vehicles, yeah. Um, helmet role play, lightsabers, uh, mm -hmm. gauntlets, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, our Nerf team gets into some of it as well, doing more, you know, IP themed Nerf yeah. guns as well. So it kind of, a lot of the rules and, and standards I talked about in the presentation, all that, at least for digital sculpting, we, it applies across the board for everything. Yeah. So uh, you just, the materials start to get mixed up a little bit more. So with role play stuff, you might see more ABS. Mm. So then it's dealing with well, how to break it up and what's the best proportional way to do that. Yeah. You know. When you're dealing with a, a, a big project like that where you have Star Wars, you know, they do, on the visual, again, on the visual effects side, they do have a lot of like models and things that they're building yeah. on in some of the studios are those things that, that might also potentially be passed off to you guys? God, I or wish. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> I wish. So you yeah. do end up having to recreate a lot of these things from scratch. Yeah, we take a lot of screen caps from the HD versions of the movies and we're we're trying to search online for yeah. the behind the scenes photos that, you know, have gotten out. Like Peter Mayhew had a bunch of great photos that he had taken throughout the whole process of being in Star Wars, and some of those have been like absolutely critical for us yeah. to see, like Han Solo's belt or right. the little gas mask that they wear when they go out into the uh, the, the big worm on the asteroid. Yeah. You know, like that was so hard to find with that canister look. Right. Like. I mean, I imagine this is what I would do if I mean I've done this with some of my own like personal work, but 
you got to go back and just watch the movie and just yeah. freeze frame it and capture that image, yep. right? That's the only way you can get some of those. Because ultimately, that is the standard everyone is going to judge for you. If, it's, if it was in the movie, mm -hmm. that's gospel. Yeah. So you can trust that. Right. If you see things outside of that, you need to be able to confirm that it's either an archive photo from Lucasfilm yeah. or it, it, again, is a set photo somehow. Yeah. Uh, and we, we can't use it otherwise, or we well, don't want to. Lucasfilm has, they do, I know that they have the very uh, intricate Star Wars books. Yes. Where they break down stuff yeah. that you never even heard of or seen of. And it's we've like got our library of things. Oh, that's that we'll got to be so cool. And, it is. Yeah, yeah it is. It's amazing. Yeah. And then um, there's certain people on staff still that, uh, like, for example, the living legend that is Mark Boudreau. Like, mm -hmm. I, I get to work pretty closely with him on vehicles, and, and that's the guy who designed the very first Millennium Falcon toy for Kenner. So that's like, remarkable. And he's the sweetest, most humble guy, and he's so great to work with. That's and, so cool. Yeah, and it's amazing. And having him sitting next to me, and we're both looking at ZBrush and talking about, and he's just, that is just so cool. You know, and he's, <laughs> and he's, he's dirty helping me. What, yeah, he's getting yeah. what he wants, and then I'm also showing him some cool stuff. Yeah. And yeah, it was a great collaboration, so. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Did, I, did you, do you feel like you, I mean, coming to the summit, how's that experience been like for you here, sort of commuting with so many different artists in different industries? It's awesome, because we're, we all have this common tool, mm -hmm. and it's, it's our main instrument. It's, you know, we're all focused on using it and yeah. uh, learning how to play with it more and, and, and just all sharing our tips and tricks. And to be in an area where it's so concentrated, and you, you, you don't, you're not going to have that anywhere else. And you almost never get that. Right, right, right. So it's, if for nothing else, if nothing else happened, everybody just standing around in the same place, it would yeah. still be an amazing experience just yeah. for that. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's amazing. And uh, even amongst this group, you know, there's a, like you said earlier, there's, there's video game people, there's film people, you know, toy industry is kind of, there's a lot out there, but it's a little bit smaller of a group. Yeah. Um, it's like kind of mixed in with like props and things like that. So connecting to the people that are actually in that group is another subsect of it that was really cool to get to speak to, you know, like the guys from McFarland last night. Or oh, that's awesome. Or another guy who makes the props in New Zealand for the Power Rangers show. And yeah. I was roommates with the manager who worked on the Power Rangers who got photos of the props that he made to make the toys. <laughs> so it's like this crazy small world of like, the I can't wait to tell Corey about this. <laughs> That's yeah. so great. I got the inside man now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, this sort of like small microcosm we have. I was talking to telling somebody last night at the party, it's, it's not quite the same number. We're a little bit bigger, but do you look at like, like quantum theorists, there's like 300 of them in the world that exist and they're all sort of studying it in their own places. Yeah. And they have this one convention that they go to every year where they like get to nerd out together. <laughs> and, like and the walls melt yeah, and their exactly. psychic power just and I've, crushes And I've listened building. to a lot of them talk about it and it's very similar to how I hear artists like yourself and us even being here. It's like, it's, we're all in these little like solo pockets. Like, yeah. in, you know, you're in like one part of the country and somebody else is in another country and somebody else is in this little town. Yeah. And like Thomas Wittelsbach is doing jewelry up in like Portland and like, yeah. it's just like these little hubs. And then it's like, everybody comes to this one spot. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we've been really glad to have you and I appreciate you telling us your story. And Absolutely. Uh, I'm so process. happy to be here as well. So. Yeah, it's been a great experience. Well, uh, for everybody who's uh, listening to this who haven't seen this, your presentation, that's going to be available uh, on our YouTube channel forever. <laughs> so for better or worse. People can watch it over and over and over. Um, but it was amazing. There was a lot of great feedback on that. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Glad yeah, hear it. and your workshop is today. So unfortunately, yes. you'll yes. never be able to uh, go to that if you're listening to this now. Well, maybe but it'll be another time. Maybe another time. <laughs> that would be great. Do you expect to do any other training in the future, or is there? Everybody's been telling me I should. Yeah, uh, I, I do it at Hasbro with um, our in-house temps I, whenever I can. It's not as regular as it should be, but and it's something I've definitely enjoyed. So I'd like to do more of it in the future. Yeah, um, it would just be a matter of you know how much is an appropriate amount and how sure. much can I say? And sure. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of course, you can give out nuggets of information. Right. I'm sure, but there's some things that you just never be able to share. Right. But hey, people just apply to Hasbro and right. uh, go learn it themselves. They get to finish that 20% themselves and make up their own final version of things. Yeah. We have our way and that has its reasons, but you might yeah. come up with your own, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for stopping by. And, uh, we My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you. Cheers, guys.